the magic word is visiony, okay? Uh, and we're going to talk about global connections. Why should I care about learning French uh, with visiony Askil San? Okay, and um, we're going to have a really good time. But we're going to find out, you know, what's why French is so good and feels so good, and if, and it's worth learning for sure. Visiony, so nice to have you on the show. Um, Thank you for uh, having me. Absolutely. Uh, so you're teaching French at uh, at the Chaminade, which is a wonderful thing to do and a, a great program. Um, and um, I, I, having a French teacher, a French person as a French teacher, really means a lot because it, it conveys much more than the language. But let me ask you that question. Aside from the language, which is very important, it has all kinds of, what do you want to call it, nuances in it. I think that's a French word. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it conveys more. What else does it convey? So in terms of language learning, the biggest question is, why should I care about learning a foreign language when we're so busy? Why learning a foreign language? Well, my first thought is that it actually promotes critical thinking. When you learn a foreign language, you have to apply the knowledge of the second language you learn to a real situation. You have to critically assess which tools are you going to need in that situation. And even when you think of second language learning, there are so many processes involved that it will promote all your critical thinking skills. When you think of the four language skills, you think of uh, listening and reading, writing, and speaking. For all of those, you need to think critically. You need to use a huge set of skills, and that will put you ahead of the game. So that really makes a big difference. Also, it improves mental flexibility. You have to be flexible. You have to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. Your, the default language is not your language, but maybe it could be the other one. So it really improves the mental flexibility, and it has such a great advantage. I could just go on and on, but I'll let you talk no, now. <laughs> no, 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 I have a million, thousand, million questions for you. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, some people really feel that French is the best language. I mean, the French do. We, we know that. Um, <laughs> uh, other people who studied it as a second language feel it's really a wonderful language. And um, my own theory about it, I want to bounce it off you and see what you think, is that somewhere along the line, you know, in the historical development of the culture in the country, there was a music. And it's the music of French. If you, we were talking about watching French movies and trying to follow what they're saying, which isn't so easy, and you have to do the remote and go back a few seconds and listen to it again and again, you get it. Yeah. But that there's a music in French that, that really isn't present in English or any other language. Some of them are really very non-musical, but French is Do you agree? How, how do you feel about that? And how did that happen? I do agree. The prosody is very different. What's really difficult with French compared to other languages, let's compare French and English. So in English, you pretty much pronounce every letter. Same as Spanish. Now in French, the difficulty with French is that there are so many consonants that you don't pronounce unless they're followed by a vowel. So if you take the word petit, small, which is used in English all the time, now, what I hear often is petite. And why do English Americans say petite or English speakers? It's because it ends with a T. But when I hear petite, what I hear is feminine. Because in French, when it ends with a T, it's petite. You don't pronounce the T, it's masculine. If you pronounce it, it means it's followed by an E and it's feminine. So sometimes for people, when they learn French, they love it. But it's so daunting because they say, I can't pronounce this language. I don't know where is the word. In between two words, you do what we call the liaison. So we, we link the word just to, to make the sound uh, easy, easier to pronounce. But as a result, sometimes you don't know if it's two words or one word. So it gets really difficult. If one word ends in a vowel, another word starts with a consonant, then you will do that liaison. So it makes it difficult, but it makes it beautiful. For me, who teaches French, of course, there's, I found it fascinating. And my students do, too, after a while. What? Once they get into the intricacies of the language, they understand there is so much more than just the music of it, that it's also logical. You think of Descartes, right? It's very logical language. So. It's, it's different, though. I mean, the sentence structure is different. Uh, mm -hmm. The juxtaposition of the verb and the noun and the subject and all that is different. So you have to learn to, to think backward a little bit. Um, the, you know, the other thing is, it seems to me, and this is just not a good thing, this in, in my lifetime anyway, 
um, the, the purity of the French language, which the French care a lot about maintaining the French language and the purity of it, has declined. And you get these new you know, 21st century words, technology words, or global words of any kind, words that come from other languages, not even English, are being incorporated in French. And I actually hate to see that, but what are you going to do? You've got, you've got to incorporate them. Am I right? How do you feel about that? So it's a very hot topic in France. Um, absolutely. And there's tons of debates about it. So you're right. Uh, France, with l'Académie Française, so we have the Académie Française. You also find the same Académie in Spain. In France, the idea of the Académie Française is to preserve the language and is to rule the language. Uh, the, one of the latest rules that the Académie Française made is to remove the accent circonflexe, which is a type of accent that some words may not need anymore. It's just to simplify oh, the language. Oh, I thought, <laughs> I thought that was forever. No, but you're right. The language, it, there's a lot of other languages coming in. But even though I'm a linguist, I'm not a purist, which means that I love languages and I love French in particular. I love to speak it, to teach it. Yet this being said, languages have evolved with other languages over the years. When you look at French, so I'm from the south of France, and there are words that I use that are based on uh, the border. So for instance, I will say with my family, I go to Je vais voir le Toubib, the doctor. Toubib is actually based on Arabic, again, with the proximity. Or uh, we can talk about il habite dans le bled. He, work, he lives in the bled is Arabic word for a small town. Um, if you live in Brittany, they will say something completely different. Uh, it used to be the oil language, so they use a lot of Gaelic. And again, same country, but we use different words based on our neighbors. But this is how languages have evolved, and I think it's all right. I think it's good to reinforce the language, but I don't think we want to make it too strict because it's how languages have evolved for centuries. This being said, French people, as you mentioned yourself, are very proud of their language. So a sign of being an intellectual in France is speaking the language really well. And I grew up, I'll give you an example. So uh, I came to the U.S. for graduate school. So I lived my whole life in the U.S. and then uh, in France, and then I came to the U.S. for graduate school. But all of my um, childhood and teenagers, we would do la dictée de pivot. So la dictée de pivot is a famous, uh, used to be a famous anchor who would do a big dictation. And in my family, and we did that many family, all of us would sit around the TV. We're talking 25 people. I come from a big family, cousins and nephews, oh, nieces. Incidentally, is it true that in the French culture, in the French country, everyone at the table with the 25 people can talk at the same time. Yes. And, and they can all understand what the other 24 people are saying. Yes. And we use our hands a whole lot, right? <laughs> yeah. So we would do all together the dictation and compare how many mistakes we've made. And there would be a pride in who has made the, le the least, <laughs> you know? And we speak at the same time, which was for my husband, who you met and talked to, uh, difficult the first time he met my family because a big family. And Everyone would talk at the same time. And the first time you told me, I don't think I made a good impression. I said, no, you did. Why would you say that? You said, well, people don't let me talk. I said, oh, no, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was fun. You know, you, you, you could keep on talking while they were talking, and they would keep on talking while you were talking. And somehow you all heard each other, and you engaged in this kind of multi multi-layered conversation. <laughs> You could have five conversations at the same time, and still it works. <laughs> that makes for great debate. I'm sure it does. Yeah, so, um, you know, French, French has, uh, why, you know, what you were saying a minute ago, in the Southwest, um, and I can't remember the name of the neighborhood there, it's where, it's at, at the Atlantic, uh, where French, French uh, is close to, uh, uh, what is it, St. Sebastian uh, in, in um, Spain, right, right there. That, that was occupied by the English mm -hmm. for quite some time, that area. And I would imagine there's a lot of English words that crept in like 300 years ago um, that are part of the language in that area. So it's interesting because there are over 3,000 Anglicisms in the French language. So Anglicisms are words that are uh, borrowed from English and used in French. And the, the reverse is true. In the English language, one third of the words are 
from French. You borrowed from French. So in France, we could say, bon weekend, uh, le marketing. Uh, and in, in the English language, there's one third are French words. The rendezvous, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not aware of how many words we use in each languages. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's everything is changing. The world is changing. Even the French are changing. <laughs> you know, I was telling you about my adventure uh, with Marcel Proust and Remembrance of Things Past. Let me try to pronounce that. Recherche de temps perdu. Okay. Très bien. <laughs> which I which I read over a whole semester. I mean, it was it was a whole semester course, and it was a huge book. And all I can remember now is it's the story of the Petit Madeleine and the keyhole, and how he remembered his his youth uh, simply by the the smell or the taste of a, a small breakfast roll. Um, I, I don't know why that's so profound, but it is profound, and, and it's a you know it's it's a very important literature for France. Um, but you would not find Anglicisms in that book, which was written what in, in the late nineteenth century. Uh, you would not find those Anglicisms at all. That was pure French. That was high literature, and I think the French still value that quality, that character of liter literature. Correct. Well, first of all, I had to say I'm very impressed that you read Proust because Proust is. You can have two pages with the same sent with one sentence, two or three pages. So it's very <laughs> difficult to read, and I'm very impressed. Even for a native speaker, it it tends to be hard. I forget where the subject is, and I'll go back a couple of pages to to see what we're talking about. Yeah. But no, you're right. In terms of that, the technology we we live in a very interconnected world, uh, in a global world where um, it does have an influence on the language. So the purest. Um, in, in linguistics, we'll say that uh, it has influenced the language. We don't. We in French, you talk about sending a uh, envoyer un email. Uh, very few people. The Académie Française actually suggested we should say courriel, which is courrier means mail and email. So the mix of courrier, a letter, and then email that is courriel, not courrier and courriel. Very few people use it, even in formal meeting. Most of people will say email. And then you have a lot of young people texting. And um, so a lot of people talk about how the French language, they do a lot of mistakes, uh, more and more mistakes texting. But to be honest, those mistakes have always existed. I see it as with this world being becoming more and more connected, then we, we exchange more. And the lingua franca is not just English anymore because we're more and more connected. Now there are multiple lingua francas. I used to be a teenager having, I started loving languages because I had pen pals, not keep off, but pen pals. I was writing letters to 15 pen pals in the world. I had this big map in my teenage room and their picture in every country. So the lingua franca was English. So with most of them, I use English, some of them German because I, I speak German too. But it really, nowadays, people have easier access to um, all the different cultures. And yeah. I think it has improved the want to learn foreign languages because it's more easily accessible. And that, I think, is wonderful. It is great that when you meet somebody who speaks three, four, or five languages. And a lot of people from Europe, even now, do speak three, four, or five languages. By the way, but I have to mention that I had a pen pal when I was in grade school. And uh, she lived, uh, I'm going to tell you her name. Her name was Danielle Sabatier. Uh, yeah. In fact, we have a host in one of our shows by the same name, Sabatier, um, but he's not related. I checked. In, in any event, uh, she lived at Rue de la Seine in Alfortville, Alfortville oh, wow. uh, which is um, in the in, in environ of Paris. And um, I thought, you know, this was the best thing since sliced bread. But, you know, we were all like eight years old and it didn't last. It was a relationship. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it didn't last. Well, of course, you know, vocabulary is very important. But I recall also that in the French world, in the French space, idioms are really, really important. I was going yes. to say to you at the beginning of the show, I was going to say, Tarul, and, and, <laughs> and see what you said to me. And that's completely idiomatic. And so many idioms in French, it must be much more than in English. Am I right? Yes, and it's fascinating to compare idiomatic expression from one language to the other, one culture to the other. So here's an example. In uh, the U.S., you could say as good as gold. 
In France, we say bon comme du bon pain, as good as bread. This is to show you the value that we have for bread, right? If it's as good as bread, it's as good as gold, right? <laughs> or another example, in the US, you say, oh, don't make a big song and dance or don't make a big deal about it. In France, we'll say, en faire tout un fromage, you're doing a big cheese about it. <laughs> Again, you see the value, the culture, what we value, right, in those idiomatic expressions. Yes, and then yes. even in the Francophone world, it varies. So recently we had Valentine's Day. So I'll give you a few examples. So for instance, in France, we talk about avoir le coup de foudre. Literally, it means to be hit by lightning, which means to fall in love. Now, if you live in Haiti, you say avoir un coup de soleil, which means uh, sunburn, to be sunburned. <laughs> but obviously, the latitude between France and Haiti, you know, it, it is sunny in south of France, but it's a lot sunnier in Haiti. <laughs> so the idiomatic, idiomatic expression vary and show the whole culture. I think it's fascinating. So do you teach the idioms? Yes. Oh, yes, for sure. And students <laughs> love the idioms. We compare them. We discuss them. It's wonderful. Yeah, well, they're all quotable quotes. And, and if you want to impress your friends, throw a few French idioms at them. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And I love to learn when I learn English. So I learned English in high school. Um, equally, I love to learn the uh, English idioms. I remember the one with the running with a chicken, like with the head cut off, something like that. I thought it was fascinating. I could picture a chicken with the head cut off. I thought, wow. Well, uh, you know, I, I, want to, I want to talk to you about how France, and of course the language has changed, but I want to talk to you about how France has changed. Uh, you know, it seems to me like uh, France is way different now, today, and, you know, just within France, um, in, you know, the, the daily life of France and the political life, I suppose, Mm -hmm. um, than it was um, back when, but when I went, when I studied French. Uh, can you talk about that? How, how has it changed? Because, because if it changes, then the, you know, the platform on which the language exists, that's changed too, as you referred. Uh, so but tell us about how it's changed. So first of all, when we think of French, we think of France. But when you think of, there are 300 million speakers in the world speaking French. and actually. 54% uh, of that live in Africa. So where French is the most spoken is on the African continent. Um, we have to think of the, uh, the, uh, the colonization, obviously. So that's one of the reasons it's most, mostly spoken in Africa. In Europe, so it's spoken in France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Monaco, the uh, Valle d'Ost, it's a little uh, valley, nor northern I Italy. So it's spoken in more than just France. And I think people in France are more aware of that. They're more aware of the influences of the world, you know, with, within the European Union and the world, the way it's more connected. And also, I think the language is evolving. One thing that when we think of the French language is the, I think of the feminization des noms de métiers. So here's an example about being more inclusive. So this is how the language is evolving. And if we're talking about uh, the future of French going forward, um, it used to be fairly sexist. Of course, I'm a woman. Again, I'm a little biased. But uh, the neutral pronoun in France, uh, in French, is il, which is masculine. So, and when you do the agreement, if you think of the past participle, it's uh, if there's one man and 25 women, that's it's okay. It's still going to be masculine because the the masculine version takes over the feminine version. The same with profession, with jobs. So um, most of the jobs, so for instance, uh, we had um, for a little bit, we had a, uh, for about four months, we had a, a female, a woman a prime minister uh, in France, and we called her Madame le Premier Ministre. She was, she was not la, la Première Ministre, but Madame le Premier Ministre. Or if you're a president, it's not la Présidente, but Madame le Président. Um, so a lot that, of professions for me... That volumes. It tells I know. You a lot. <laughs> I know. So for me as a professor, I'm not la professeur, I'm le professeur. If you're a doctor, you're not la doctoresse, but la, uh, Madame le docteur. Now, in Canada, for instance, they've evolved even before us with the language. So while in France, you say le docteur for women, in Canada, 
in Quebec, you say la doctoresse. Uh, you say une écrivaine, which to me sounds funny. Why? Because I'm a, I'm a French, from, French person from France and I'm not used to it. But on a conceptual level, I think it's great. So France is evolving that way as we're uh, opening the borders, as living within an uh, interconnected world. We are uh, removing the some of those uh, uh, ancestor barriers and we're doing the feminization des noms de métiers. We are um, also uh, embracing other languages within the language. Well, it's still a pride. The language is still a form of pride. I think it has evolved a lot in the last 30, 40, 40 years. Well, it was, it was known, it has been known for hundreds of years as a language of diplomacy. Yes. Uh, really everywhere. And it wasn't just because of the colonialization you mentioned. It was just a language that was, it was a common denominator around the world. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. used in, in diplomatic relations. Uh, 30, and, and, 32 and, and, states and government use French nowadays as an yeah. official language. And it's the language of NATO, of the United Nations, of the Olympic Games. Uh, it's the language of uh, a lot of, of uh, um, La, La Croix Rouge Red Cross, Spanish and English. Yeah, Lingua Franca is what I'm trying to remember. <clears throat> so here's the thing. You, you get on um, chat GBT, all right? And you say, would you please um, translate a Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past into English, and you'll have a full and accurate translation, you know, in, in, in seconds, the whole thing. And um, that, that goes for, you know, dealing diplomatically. It goes for, you know, contracts. It, it goes for all communication. Furthermore, I can get on my phone and, and you can speak French into my phone and it'll tell me what you said in English. So, you know, it goes to our principal question here. Why should I care about learning French? Why should I care about learning any language um, as long as I've got the phone and the computer and the chat uh, uh, GPT? I can always get a handle on it and a much better handle even if I, even if I had studied the other language. So where is this all going? Now, you're, you're into linguistics, Virginie, and so the question is, um, isn't this going to destroy the difference between languages? So earlier I said I'm not a purist. Well, when it comes to translation, maybe I will, I will say so. I, Google is wonderful, but I will not suggest you use Google when you translate. Why? Because when we learn another language, and this is where we have to be up, put ourselves outside of our comfort zone, when we learn a foreign language, one and one is not always two. Depends on the context. Sometimes it'll be three, sometimes it'll be two, sometimes it'll be two and a half. Context plays a big role. And this is where it gets difficult, is to allow room for ambiguity. And this is where it gets really hard learning a foreign language. You don't learn just a set of grammatical and syntactic rules. You learn a whole new ideology, new concept. An example that I'll give you, if you think of possessive pronouns. So in English, let's say, you and I are together in the same room. I left my purse and someone is asking you, whose bag is it? And in English, you would say it's her bag. And you'll say her because I'm a woman. And the, the gender, the possessive pronoun depends on who owns the bag. In French, it's different. In French, you will say, c'est son sac. And son is masculine, even though you're talking about me. And the reason why you'll say that is because it agrees with what is being possessed, what's being owned, and not the owner. So you, you will have to think completely differently. Again, not just a set of rules, it's just a whole new ideology is thinking differently. And it really, it promotes creative thinking. When you learn, if you just use a translator, great, you have a translation, sometimes a little mediocre, but you have one and you can read. And I'm saying exposure is good. I will never say not to do it, but I think it's added to what you can learn much more. You learn about a country, you learn about a culture. As you learn even the grammatical rules, the one is that I illustrated, students ask me, so if table in French is la table, is feminine, is it because we think it's more feminine? So I, I go through all those, all, even those simple rules, you have to dive into the culture. And that you can't just learn by looking at the translator. You will learn so much more about you. You'll be more creative. You'll be able to 
use your creative thinkings because you're seeing the world through a different lens. And that's what learning a new, another language gives you is learning the learning about the world, about the culture through a different lens, learning that your own culture is not the default mode, but it's just one among many. And that puts your head of the game, not just because of French or any other foreign language, that puts your head because it also gives you empathy. And I think it's so very important in this world to have empathy towards others. And that we can only have when we learn another language, when we learn a foreign language, a different culture, a different ideology. I'm very passionate about it. No, oh, I know, and, and I totally agree with you. What, what, you know, what is interesting is that um, French, the language of diplomacy, has a, a very uh, reserved vocabulary for nuance, but also for ambiguity. You use that word, ambiguity. And so if I'm going to have a, what do you want to call it, a, a tense conversation with somebody who may not be you know, geopolitically aligned with me, I would like to be somewhat am ambiguous. <laughs> and this has been useful for hundreds, thousands of years, actually. <laughs> so it works well. You know, I'm, I'm watching a, a serial now about uh, an Italian woman who uh, in the late 19th century uh, uh, was, was um, trained as a doctor. I'm sorry, a lawyer. And uh, the local authorities in, in, uh, in Turin uh, uh, threw her out of the bar because she was a woman, okay? And, and, and so you have a, a, European, a European sexist kind of tradition mm -hmm. there. And I wonder if, if we were speaking about Italian, okay, instead of French today, would our conversation be different? And in what ways would it be different? You know, when you look at the Roman languages, so Spanish, Italian, France, we have a lot in common. We have so much in common. Of course, I'll say that because I think my perspective is a little different. I'm a linguist. I live in the U.S. Now, if you would have asked me that maybe 20 years ago before I came here, maybe my answer would be very different. You know, we all have some pride when we created the European Union, the idea when we created even the euro, one side is the number, the other side is part of, the, of every different country because we want to keep our identity. And I think identity is so important. When you learn a foreign language, I don't say that you should lose your identity. We all have our identity, but we have a lot in common. And it's good to learn about other identities to forge your own. And I've never loved France as much as when I started teaching it. I've never been patriotic. I've never even gone into the Eiffel Tower until recently when I took students abroad. They told me, they said, Dr. Askelson, you're French. You've never been on the Eiffel Tower? I said, I live here. I never saw the necessity, but I've been on the Great Wall of China. I've been at the <laughs> Burj Al Khalifa in Dubai. You know, we have the tendency to look at what's far and we don't see what's close. And since I've been living here, I've rediscovered my own culture. And, and it's wonderful to learn about my culture through the eyes of people who live here with me in Hawaii and other, other places. So you mentioned that you also speak German, did you say? Uh, yes. So if I asked you the same question about German, what would you say about the, the German language? The German language is really interesting to me. It's very logical. So I used to work in Berlin. I work as a press attaché at the embassy in Berlin, and I used to do a lot of translation. And I used to, I would get up at five in the morning, I would read the paper, and with my colleagues, we would report on how every, every different German paper portray France. It was really interesting. I love my job. I got to meet a lot of politicians. I met Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, a former president who I thought was pretty amazing. Um, but um, the German language is very different. A lot of people think of, oh, the sound, it doesn't sound quite as, quite as nice as the French language. To me, it's not just about the sound of the language. It's, it's the culture, is part of my heart. I, my heart is divided in many countries and part of it is also in Germany. And um, I love my work. I love the culture and um, and Germany and France, you know, we're talking about World War II, you know, that um, we're trying to move forward uh, with the European Union. We're trying to move forward. And I think um, we're trying to look at um, different ways to move forward. We're trying to trying to be more sustainable, trying to look at alternative form of energy, trying to look at 
you know, the, the world and how it can advance. And, and to me, while we should not forget the past, the past is very important. And that's what we celebrate and we need to talk about every year, yet we have to move forward. And I think when you learn foreign languages, whether it's German or Italian, it helps you do that. It helps you to put, you know, one more break on that, uh, you know, on the, on the, on going forward. And I think it's very important. Yeah, you have to have them both. Yeah. <laughs> and in French, you know, in, in France, I mean, there's, there's so many uh, wonderful pieces of history. I mean, for example, if you wanted to see an opera, you would go to the Bastille. And at the Bastille, some of the people who pay hundreds of dollars for a seat at the Bastille to see the opera, uh, they roller skate in. They roller skate <laughs> down the aisles, get to their seat. You know, so this, wait a minute, that, that was a prison. That was, awful things happened there. And so I think, you know, in France, you know, I, I'm interested in your reaction. In France, you have people who, um, you know, celebrate the, the values of the French Revolution today. It defines, a, you know, a good part of the French character, the French Revolution still today. But at the same time, there are people who, who long for even respect the monarchy that happened before. Those were the glory days. Uh, and finally, the third part of my little triangle that I'm throwing at you is the food. The food, the food in France is like a religion. And, yes. And all those these three, three things, you know, they, 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 they play together in terms of developing not just the culture, but the mindset. And if, if, you, if you connect the mindset with the language, then thus the language also. Um, all of those three things, and maybe more. What are your thoughts? You know, I think the past can make us stronger. I think when you think of the French Revolution, July 14, 1789, the Prise de la Bastille, um, to me, it, it this is when we started to have the Republic, right? And uh, democracy. And um, there is, you'll always find people who are nostalgic. And I think that there's value in that as well. Um, you know, this is the whole idea of traditions, but I think it's good today to blend those tradition with the history. And I think that will make us stronger. And you're right, it's all interconnected. And I think sometimes France plays a little bit that to um, market themselves as well. And um, so I have mixed feelings about it, but in terms of the food, um, it's a great source of pride. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I talked about the language being a source of pride, but the food is equally a source of pride. Um, being able to eat in a healthy manner and eating well and socialization happened in France over food. That's how it works. And meals are lengthy. They're important. When we talk about any celebration, it's not the music that matters or not the location that matters. It's the food. When I got married uh, in France and I got married in the U.S., got married twice. When we got married in France, uh, about 60 percent of the budget was spent on the food. And that's very common. And yeah, my wife and I went to um, the, the headquarters for the Banco National de Paris, which is mm -hmm. right near the, the old opera. I forget the name of that. The, you know, uh, that's quite a building. It's where the, they had the phantom. That's where. <laughs> Uh, the Phantom de l'Opéra, yeah. <laughs> okay, and every officer in BNP, in this headquarters, which is a big Napoleonic building, uh, every officer had his own dining room. Yeah, yeah. I, I say his because they were mostly men, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. L'Opéra Garnier is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so these guys would spend a good part of their day, within the business day, you know, entertaining people in their own dining room with their own wait staff. And all that. That's how valuable it was in, in, the, in the business community. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, Chaminade and, and Hawaii and linguistics and French and maybe other languages. Um, where is it going? You know, there are certain things that have been dropped out of the curriculum in the public consciousness and the consciousness of students going forward. Um, I guess they're under pressure to take courses that, uh, that will earn them more money uh, or get them a job somewhere here or elsewhere. And um, you know, I just wonder how that plays out in Chaminade and elsewhere. 
in Hawaii and how you feel about it. So Shaminad um, offers a variety of languages, Hawaiian being one of the languages they offer. And um, I think whether it is Shaminad or UH, UH also offers a variety of languages, French included, uh, and other Roman languages, um, or um, the community college also offers French, then uh, uh, different high school offer different languages. Um, to me, irrespective of the school, I always encourage the students, if they can, to take one of the languages. Of course, French is one language that, that I will root for, but um, I think if they start learning any language, then once you have a foot in, once your nodes are connected, then intrinsically you're getting the bug, you're going to learn another language. So if someone's telling me, oh, you know, I le I'm learning Japanese, I say, that's wonderful. And it's true, I love Japanese as well. But in my head, I'm thinking, oh, you're gonna learn another language, you know? And that's how it starts. That's why multilingual speakers are also ahead of the game. Because once you learn one language, you respect of the language, you are setting yourself for learning more and being, of course, more marketable. And in Hawaii, whether you learn Hawaiian or any other language, you are ahead of the game. You are more marketable, you are aware of other cultures, you have more empathy toward others, you are more creative, you can think critically, you have, uh, you are so ahead. And it's fun. Of course, it's fun. You know, I forget to mention that. It's a yeah, lot of fun. Tremendous advantage when you're traveling. You can really get close to people and develop relationships with them instantaneously if you speak their, their language. I, I'd like to mention also that, uh, you know, I was the hi hiring partner of my law firm. And if somebody had a resume uh, that included some foreign language, especially French, that person would have a huge advantage. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm not in law, but I wish I would have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, so, I totally agree with you. It's another level of consciousness. And if you are into another language or a bunch of languages, you understand you know, the difference between the way people think in this language and that culture, um, boy, you're having a better life. It's a better life. Uh, you rise above the, the common fray. You rise above where you happen to be. You, you rise into humanity in general at the 50,000 foot level. You can understand things. And in terms of, you were asking me about linguistically, it also increases your attention span once you know another language. Because nowadays in this world, if we're interconnected world, our attention span gets shorter and shorter. But if you learn a foreign language, you will definitely increase your attention span because you have to uh, look at the different processes involved in learning a second language. So it really completely changes your mindset. It, it changes everything. And it really puts you ahead in so many different ways. And, and I think it's wonderful. Well, I hope people get the idea, including here in Hawaii. You know, we have a a polyglot community anyway, but a lot of yeah. a lot of grandchildren never learned what their grandparents uh, were speaking. And we need to get back to that. And I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. Version, and I think, ask you, go ahead. And I think it's important too, if we have, the, if whatever our home language is, if we have children, to, to give that to our children. It's much easier to do that today than it was 50 years ago. So if your native language is Hawaiian, if your native language is French, then try to to give that to your children. It's not easy. I have a son who is bilingual, French and English, and it's not easy to do every day, but it's important to, to do it for them. So if I'm um, an old guy um, and I want to I want to, you know, revisit my my French here in Hawaii, uh, how do I do that? There are multiple opportunities. Of course, there's the Alliance Française. So you're welcome to go to the Alliance Française. Uh, you can take classes, you can take classes at any post-secondary uh, university. Uh, you can um, also expose yourself uh, to a lot of French. You can actually uh, tutor. I tutor on the side, <laughs> side notes. <laughs> but there are many, many opportunities. My, my um, advice would be to expose yourself to as much French as you can, whether it is listening to podcasts, uh, whether it is listening to French music on your way to work in your car, whether it is to watch French movies, I know that you do, 
uh, any French exposure you can get, and it's a lot easier now than it used to be, then will help. And intrinsic motivation is a key factor in learning a foreign language. A lot of people come to me and they tell me, I'm not gifted. You have to be gifted to learn a foreign language. This is not me. I'm not good. I took French in high school. I wasn't doing well. I don't know what I should do. And I said, no, it's not about a gift. To me, speaking a foreign language is not a gift. It's all about your view and your personality. So your view means uh, your motivation, intrinsic or extrinsic. A lot of research has shown that intrinsic motivation is better, which means your love for a culture, than extrinsic. Extrinsic is doing something for a reward. So if you're a student, it's to get a good grade. If you're doing it for a job, uh, then you know that would be extrinsic. But research has shown now today that whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, it will conduce to um, a favorable outcome, which means you will still learn the language. So at the end, if you're someone who's motivated, who's passionate about the culture or the cultures that you're looking at, if you are um, have a personality that is you're willing to put yourself outside of your comfort zone, you're willing to take risks, then it will be easier for you to learn a foreign language. You hear a lot of people who said, oh, I'm better when I drink some wine. I can speak the language better. Well, <laughs> the idea behind that is anxiety, is peer pressure, right? Why is it more difficult to learn a foreign language when you're an adult than when you're a child? Because when you're a child, you just absorb, you speak, you don't worry about what others think. When you're an adult, you're thinking, you know, how do I sound? Am I ridiculous? You have this pressure. So nowadays in the language classroom, we have a lot of strategies to help to alleviate that pressure, to lower the effective filter. Because the higher the effective filter is, the more anxious you are, the more difficult it will be to produce. So the idea is to lower the effective filter. And we teach the students strategies. So for instance, strategy competence. So when you are in a foreign country, you're in France, and I remember you talking about the SNCF, you are wondering what's happening. What am I, what are they talking about? I'm missing the words. Then in that case, use strategy competence, which means use leverage what you know to compensate for what you don't. So if you want to talk about something that is expensive, and you forgot the word in French for expensive, that, but you do remember cheap and say it's not cheap, right? You can use your convocation, you can paraphrase. You can also use nonverbal communication. 60% of the communication in the world is nonverbal. And we forget that. We can use our hands, we can mimic, we can use visuals. So there's a lot of ways to get the message across, not just with the, the proper word, but with different ways we can get the meaning across. And that makes a big difference. And that really alleviates that that anxiety factor that is in the way of learning and speaking a foreign language. Cher, blue share. Expensive. Yes, <laughs> c'est ça. C'est très bien. Yeah. Très uh, cher. Virginie Asquilson, so good to talk to you. I hope we can do this again. That's why I say to you, à bientôt. À bientôt. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> Au revoir. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.